Historically, Wisconsin was a stronghold of the labor movement in the United States. The leader of the progressive movement in the early 20th century was Robert La Follette, who served as a Wisconsin senator, its governor, and a member of the House of Representatives. In 1911, Wisconsin became the first state to adopt workers' compensation for injured workers, and in 1932, it became the first state to offer unemployment compensation. All that came to an end in 2011, when Republican Governor Scott Walker took office. Less than a month into his term, he proposed legislation ending collective bargaining rights for public employees, even though he had never mentioned this issue during his campaign. The Republican legislature passed the bill, and it was enacted into law less than a month later. The passage of this law, known as Act 10, led to a series of events that embroiled the Wisconsin Supreme Court in controversy, sparking an intense partisan battle for control of the court that has lasted to this day. Opponents of the law filed a lawsuit to block Act 10, a lawsuit that was destined to come before the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Although the court is technically nonpartisan, the court at that time had four conservative and three liberal justices. In 2011, conservative Justice David Prosser was up for re-election. He was challenged by liberal Joanne Kloppenberg. Liberal groups turned this election into a referendum on Governor Walker and his anti-union legislation. What this really comes down to in Wisconsin is a question of uh, how independent this court will be of the governor. Now, it happens at this point that the court is uh, a 4-3 conservative split that leans toward a position of being very favorable toward this governor, not just on this issue, but on a host of issues. If Joanne Kloppenberg beats David Prosser, then the court will be narrowly aligned in opposition to or at least in skepticism toward the governor. Unions and progressive interest groups spent millions of dollars in support of Kloppenberg and mobilized a vigorous grassroots campaign. The election attracted an unusual amount of attention for a judicial race. We are going to have an unprecedented turnout for a uh, spring election for a court. We will have more people voting in this election than we've pr had in some gubernatorial elections, at least in some areas of the state. And I can tell you that in Madison, uh, the, it looks as if uh, some precincts will have a presidential election level turnout. The race was extremely close. Liberal Kloppenberg clung to a 204 vote lead on election night. But the state is waiting to confirm the vote before naming a winner. Now, right now, the AP's tally has challenger Joanne Kloppenberg with 740,090 votes. Incumbent David Prosser falls about 200 short at 739,886. Kloppenberg today declared herself the winner. Justice Prosser says he's waiting until the state's count is finished. But several voting discrepancies were reported. And after an official recount, David Prosser was declared the winner, maintaining the conservatives' 4-3 to three majority. It was a bitter defeat for liberals, and it had the consequences they feared. The law that effectively ended collective bargaining for most public employees in Wisconsin was declared constitutional today. That ruling from the state Supreme Court this morning, here are the facts in the case. The court's ruling was 5-2. to two. The battle was joined again in 2016. Walker appointee Rebecca Bradley was up for re-election. She was challenged by liberal Joanne Koppenberg, who had lost in 2011. Once again, liberal and conservative groups poured millions of dollars into the race. Once again, interest in the election was very high, with record-breaking voter turnout. Once again, the outcome was extremely close. And once again, the liberals lost, Bradley won by half a percent allowing conservatives to maintain their 5-2 to two majority. Liberals got another shot two years later, when conservative Justice Michael Gableman retired. The 2018 election was a major victory for Democrats nationally, and liberals finally got a victory in Wisconsin when Rebecca Dallet won, narrowing the 5-2 conservative majority, making it 4-3. Another election was held in 2019. Once again, it was extremely close, with liberals suffering yet another defeat, when conservative Brian Hagedorn defeated liberal Lisa Neubauer by half a percent, giving conservatives back their 5-2 to two majority. The most interesting election of all was held in April 2020. Conservative Justice Daniel Kelly ran for re-election against liberal challenger Jill Karfoski. The election was scheduled for April, when the coronavirus pandemic broke out. State health officials recommended expanding voting by mail, in order to reduce the risk of voters catching coronavirus. Republicans opposed this plan, 
believing that a low turnout would help elect the conservative candidate. After a federal judge issued a ruling making it easier to vote by mail, the U.S. Supreme Court intervened. The five conservative justices forced Wisconsin to move ahead with in-person voting, with the court's four liberals dissenting. The decision was criticized for forcing voters to choose between voting and endangering their health. And Democrats say the Republican-controlled legislature opted to go forward for a cynical reason. They believe that fear of the virus will drive down turnout in urban Democratic areas, but less so in rural areas dominated by Republicans. But the conservatives' plans were thwarted. Democratic voters, angered by Republican obstructionism, turned out heavily, and Karfoski beat Kelly, reducing the conservative majority once again to four to three. One month later, the court heard a challenge to Democratic Governor Tony Evers' shelter-in-place orders to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. Despite the fact that he had just been defeated, Justice Kelly participated in the case. He cast the deciding vote in a four-to-three party-line decision to end the shelter-in-place orders. So after five elections held over less than a decade, liberals and conservatives have fought hard and traded victories, but conservatives retained their majority for the entire period. The next opportunity for liberals is scheduled to arrive in 2023, when conservative justice Patricia Rogensack will face re-election.